Hello, everyone. Can you hear us? Apologies about that. Uh, a little bit late tonight, but I am so excited and looking forward to today's guest. I am here with Jason Maxwell. Can everyone hear me? Because I'm also seeing that it still says we have, that we may or may not be on. Are we here? Um, I think we're good. Let us know if you can or cannot hear me, everyone. But I think we're good now. I am here with Jason Maxwell, and we're going to talk again about the Rebecca Barsotti case because a lot is happening. In fact, Jason and I know some things that are happening right now in Superior, Montana, that we may or may not be able to talk about tonight. But uh, hey, Voice for the Voiceless, and Stephanie Budge, and Julie Holden, and Scott, and thank you everyone for being here. First and foremost, Jason Maxwell. Uh, is a veteran. Can you share a little bit about your service? Uh, yeah, in uh, 2004, I joined the Marine Corps. Uh, graduated graduated boot camp in uh, 2005. Went to School of Infantry. Uh, gra graduated that as an infantry Marine. Once I checked into my unit, about uh, two weeks after that, I took a uh, voluntary trip over to Iraq as a casualty replacement for uh, 325, uh, finished that deployment out, uh, went back again in 2008 as, as convoy security. Uh, during that deployment, I was medevaced out and came back and, and was a platoon sergeant for the wounded warriors battalion out of Balboa hospital. Um, finished, finished out my career doing, uh, uh, death notifications and, and funeral details. So. Thank you for sharing that. And so before we begin, I just want to say thank you for your yep. service. Yep. Uh, we are very grateful for our men and women who serve. And uh, thank you. Truly, thank you. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. Beyond your military service, and uh, you are also David Barsotti's neighbor. You are a Montana boy through and through. Is that right? That is right. Born and raised in Derby, Montana. Okay. And uh, now settled with your family in Superior. And Correct. you live just down the street from David Barsotti, um, a person that uh, people here at Hidden True Crime are very curious about. David Barsotti, for everyone that might just be joining the Rebecca Barsotti case, as we've only been covering it for a little bit now, David Barsotti is the estranged husband of Rebecca Barsotti. Rebecca Barsotti went missing last year in July. Her body was found last month in Superior uh, on the riverbank, and it is currently still at the Montana Crime Lab while her estranged husband is fighting for her remains in court. Uh, her Rebecca's parents would like them. Uh, David Barsotti also had a domestic violence charge against him uh, stemming from March 2022 of this year. Two months later, three months later, July, that's when Rebecca went missing. While she was missing, that domestic violence charge was dismissed. A jury found him not guilty. And I have a bit of that hearing on our channel as well. I don't know if you saw that, Jason, but uh, earlier today before your live, I decided to post a bit of that hearing because what they say at the moment that I posted is so important. He, it, I, I, Believe me, I am so disappointed it, uh, his charges were dismissed. It is heart-wrenching that uh, Rebecca Barsotti's voice couldn't be heard during that hearing, nor did the jury even know that she was missing. They just assumed she didn't show up. But during that hearing, this Marine, David Barsotti says he is a Marine and talks a lot about his military service. They pointed out, the state attorney pointed out that he had only served for four months and 11 days. And so <laughs> you saw that picture, uh, that painting now, that picture of the sign. Uh, what does that sign say in front of your house, Jason? It says uh, four months and 11 days does not make a, makes a liar. It does not make a Marine. And, and it's, and it's true. So. It's true. So, yes. And uh, you, you took a stand with that when you learned that. Um, and, and first off, just thank you for that because uh, more allies I think are needed uh, right now 
for Rebecca and for justice and just for an investigation. How about that? We don't know what happened. We don't know. Uh, we can all speculate what perhaps happened. And um, I'll definitely ask you for your thoughts. But thank you for standing up for that. I know that many people in town that I have talked to say they are scared of David Barsotti, that they believe the sheriff's office, the Mineral County Sheriff's Office should investigate more into her death. They've declared it a river drowning, an accidental river drowning and half from the beginning, but they're scared to come forward and to talk. And so the first thing I said to Jason on the phone with them, once I received his contact information, I said, Hey, look, everything we say is off record, but what did you say? What did you, I, I love what he said to me. Um, do you remember what you said or why you're uh, coming forward? It, it, it may have been something similar to uh, everything that I say can be on record because I'm not I'm not afraid of the coward. Uh, I want him. I want him to know that we know that he's a liar. Uh, we know we know for a fact he wasn't in the Marines. We know for a fact he didn't serve for Blackwater. And so we need to call him out on on the facts that we know right now. You know, and, and we can speculate what happened to Rebecca right now. But right now we can pound home that he was never a Marine and he was never with Blackwater. Thank you. In other words, real Marines aren't afraid to come forward. Correct. <laughs> Correct. Thank you for coming forward. Um, and so I, I believe that gives a bit of background as to why you're here. And so not only are you taking a stand and being brave enough to come forward about some truth that you've discovered, you also know him. You are his neighbor. You've communicated with him. Um, uh, and Julie Holden already is asking, I'd love to know if David still has the Merc one license plate. Uh, you're only allowed to have one. If, uh, one of those licenses plates in Montana, if you actually are a veteran, is that true or that is true. So, uh, when I, when I found out that he wasn't, uh, in the Marine Corps, uh, I ended up calling the DMV here in superior. Uh, they forwarded me to Missoula who who, Missoula County, who were the ones that issued in the license plates. They told me they couldn't give out that information and why he had the license plates. However, they did mess up and wrote down all of his license plate numbers. So I know he has Merc 1, he has Merc 2. Um, and so they forwarded me on to the state. The, the state right now uh, cannot take away the license plates until an investigation is done. However, they do have a stop on the license plates. So once those license tags, he will not be able to renew them until he goes into Veterans Affairs and gets certified by them and proved that he was actually in the service. Wow. Wow. How did you learn about the four months and 11 days? I like that. That's what we'll call this four months and 11 days. And let me ask you, what does that mean? Did he finish boot camp? I mean, what does four months and 11 days in the military even mean? Maybe we should clear that up first. So, so Technically, to get through boot camp, Marine Corps boot camp, it's 13 and a half weeks. He was there for four months, 11 days. So he was he ended up hurting himself, whether it was um, uh, and I believe on his DD-214 that was released. It says a it says a shoulder injury. So during that time, during boot camp, there's there's three phases. First phase, second phase and the third phase, of course. And you graduate to each phase. If he if he injured himself in in second phase, and couldn't make make any training then they would hold him back they would let the rest of his guys go they would hold him back first phase would come up and he would start over basically that second phase after a certain amount of time medical will just say hey you're never going to make it through uh so what we're going to do is we're going to um entry level separation you which is there was a contract drawn up between david and the marine corps that said, hey, you fulfill your contract and we'll fulfill ours with you. He couldn't do that because of his injury. They didn't want to fulfill theirs. So they give him an entry level separation, which basically says nobody's at fault. We're just going to end the contract where it is. So. Okay. Okay. And Julie Holden again pointed out that in what I posted from the hearing, it says that he injured his shoulder lifting weights. And Julie or anyone, oh, uh, you can share, if you wouldn't mind sharing that part of the hearing, uh, that I would uh, appreciate that. And then Julie Holden 
is also pointing out that you can see this, uh, his document on a blog post mm -hmm. here. And, um, I, and, and you sent that to me and you looked at it and you told me about it. Yes. His discharge. And it simply did say that shoulder injury. Yep. Shoulder injury with an entry level separation. And, and I, I had heard or through rumors that he had never really served. And so when I had the opportunity, my wife and I went to his uh, domestic trial. And so they ended up bringing up his credibility prove that it, to prove that he was a liar because inside of the videos with um, Deputy Noble, he's saying he was he was PTSD. He doesn't know what's going on. He doesn't know what makes him angry. It's just flashbacks from war. And so in that video, they use that to discredit him and and brought out his DD-214. And that's the entire time I, I stared him down the entire time. I would not look away because I knew he was a liar. I knew I, I knew he, he was done then. Okay. Okay. And that's when you knew, uh, Nathan, um, Nathan's also known AKA as the Hitman. Although Nathan's been on our channel a couple of times, we've released some of the recordings between him and David Barsotti on our channel. And he's, he, he believed, uh, when we brought this up to him, uh, Nathan was his friend for many years and, and wants to believe David to some, you know, to some point, even though he's, uh, letting it, know now, you know, some of the recorded calls he has that are quite uh, telling, quite dark, uh, sharing that he wants to kill his um, in-laws, at least alleging, you know, implying that. But uh, he said, well, no, 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 he was a mercenary. He was a mercenary. I know that. He, even though he wasn't in the military and it was only four months, what he really is, is, a, you know, he goes on secret missions. And can you tell us a little bit about that? Because that left a lot of people that don't understand the military fully in question. That was a question I had for you during our first time we talked. Yeah. So what I got, when I got out of the Marines, uh, a lot of my buddies ended up doing the same work that, that David claims to have been doing, uh, working for triple water or uh, triple canopy, black water, uh, those private groups like that. Um, and there's, there's a lot to listen to when you listen to a guy like David versus guys that have actually been in, he's, he's preying on people that don't know the difference, right? Because you can't, you, you have to believe him to a certain extent because you can't prove him wrong if you don't know. Right. And so he, he preys on, on people like Nathan and, and I knew, I knew from day one, from when he tried selling me his, his black water pistol, he was never in, in, uh, Blackwater. It was just, it, it, his pistol was a giveaway. That, and that's what Nathan claimed. Blackwater, Blackwater. So, so tell us about this pistol. He tried to sell this to you. Is that right? He did. He tried, he, uh, he needed some money. He tried selling me the, the pistol. And I said, I can reach out to some of my friends, see if, see if they'd be interested in it. Uh, so end up, you, you look a little bit more into the pistol. It's got the serial number on it. Uh, that, that actual pistol was made from the serial number. It's uh, U637 was made in the year of uh, between 1999 and 2000 by uh, SIG Arms. Blackwater and SIG Arms teamed up to make their first Blackwater pistol, the P226 in 2006. So apparently David has this mythical pistol that has just come out of nowhere six years before they even started making them. So one of two things is either going on. Uh, he either put the logo on it himself or he bought a slide and, and replaced the slide. And either one is really, I mean, either one is pretty damning, right? I mean, right. whichever way you look at it. Wow. But if you don't Thanks. know, you don't know. And that's how you sell a story, right? You have to, you have to be larger than your story. So you got to have, you got to have the vehicles decked out with toe straps like he does. You got to have the Marine Corps and veteran stickers all over everything. You got to walk around with a Haji schmock around your neck and, and pretend you're in the desert 24 seven with a gun on your fist, on your head. It's just, uh, he's, he's trying to portray an image that he's trying to sell to the people. Yeah. A lot of people are saying how offensive this must be to 
real heroes like you, real veterans. And I, and I agree, stolen valor is not something, you know, to take lightly. And, and I completely now, you know, understand that sign in your yard uh, with with that gun. Uh, he he has tried to sell people a lot of guns. He sent you photos of the gun, as you pointed out. Um, the pictures of that gun, by the way, are on the Facebook page, True Crime Underground. WTF happened to Rebecca Barsotti. You're on that group as well. Uh, I have shared some things. And even in looking at those pictures, uh, some uh, online sleuths have discovered more. So if anybody really wants to delve into um, the discussion and sleuthing and finding information, I'd recommend that group. And then when it comes to Nathan, we're talking about Nathan, the friend of David Barsotti. You mentioned that he preys on people like him. And, and I agree. And I think in the end that Nathan realized that he said, oh, I think he was going to make me my fall guy. And he he came forward and he started recording calls because David Barsotti was asking Nathan to do some frightening things to, uh, to, you know, he was implying to kill his in-laws or, you know, Rebecca's parents while they looked to burn their house down as well. Um, the, I, uh, true crime underground has released more recordings of those. And so if someone has the link to some of those, I'd appreciate that too. There are three or four calls that I'd recommend everyone listening to that are not on my channel. And in those calls, uh, uh, in those calls, David talks about how he lost 27 men, 27 men. He says that he, uh, he's going to, uh, he wants a massacre or else his name isn't David Barsotti. And, uh, because nobody will ever, um, you know, mess with the United States military again. I don't know if you've heard these new recordings, but when you hear these recordings, uh, that you have heard. I'm sure you've heard some of them. I mean, what are your thoughts? What what have you taken from these recordings with Nathan about your neighbor? Yeah, so I listened to the one about the 27 men today uh, on my way into work. And that one that one actually fired me up a little bit uh, because of the first the first deployment that we went on. Uh, we were going over as casualty replacements for 325. Uh, they lost they lost 46 Marines and and two sailors uh the fifth regiment of the army over in iraq lost uh 31 of their men so oh. so so now you listen to david who's claiming that he lost 27 of his own men uh yet it's it's nowhere online nowhere in the news it's never been publicized anywhere uh you you can tell he's just lying and in, in trying to get some sympathy and and uh, back his story. So then I thought, okay, well, what, what movie did he pull this from? He's, he's got to be getting his information somewhere. And so I start Googling 27 man, uh, military, uh, ended up Googling 27 men, uh, killed Blackwater. Boom. Pops up. It hits. So, wow. So there's an article about Blackwater. One of their helicopters went down with, with, uh, what they believed, uh, were five, crew members on it if uh and they were still doing the investigation at the time if all five of those uh men who died that would have put blackwater's total from the time they started to up until that point that that helicopter went down uh 27 deaths so he's he's just he's basically reading articles watching movies pulling information from wherever you can get it and, and creating storylines with it. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I've heard uh, many of the sources again that I talked to, and I know, I know that you've been contacted by many sources as well. And I think what's interesting, Jason is in this case, because the sheriff's department, the mineral County sheriff's department is essentially to, to my knowledge, refusing to do anything. You have become sort of like a tip line for people that think, "Gal, who will listen to me?" You know, and, and it's been the same, similar with me. And a lot of these people don't want to uh, be known. But someone did mention to me that he loved Jason Bourne. You know, that he was really into Jason Bourne movies. And you're mentioning this 27 Men. It made me think about his eye patch, right? And I know that there's a movie with Tom Cruise <laughs> with an eye patch. But tell us about that eye patch, by the way, because another recording uh, is. David Barsotti telling Nathan he only has one eye. We do have a picture of him showing both eyes. He does have both eyes. 
So, so tell us about uh, your experience and what you've seen with this eye patch he wears. Oh, the the eye patch. That one's a that one's a fun one uh, because the first the very first time that we met him, uh, he said he said he was blown up in an IED blast. Uh, the optic nerve in his eye was severed and that's why he wears an eye patch. Uh, that was the story that he told us. And, and of course he probably has told everybody else different stories. Uh, however, we got him over to our place one, one evening and, and we were just talking, uh, drinking whiskey and sure enough, his eye patch goes from his eye to his forehead. And, and we start, we start looking at him and cause we were a little bit baffled cause he's, he had both of his eyes and, and, uh, uh, he, he eventually did slip up and say that, um, he has a condition from high blood pressure that does not allow both of his eyes to focus on one thing at, at, at the same time. So he keeps one of his eyes, eyes covered and it gets rid of the headaches and it makes it a little easier for him to see, uh, now, depending on how much alcohol he drinks, it just depends on what eye gets covered at the time. Um, but even even when even for the domestic, when uh, Deputy Nobles was over at his house and they released the court videos of that, um, he he wasn't wearing an eye patch the entire time, and he's he's looking around. Both eyes are moving. They're they're there. He just he just keeps one covered so he can he can focus. Hmm. And you know, that's a fair reason. To, I mean, maybe there, there is something to that, that he can't focus both eyes and that would be fair. But, but as you point out, it's interesting. He's not telling people that story. Right. Very, yeah. very interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, wow, there's a, there's another experience you have with him. Uh, you have spent a lot of time with him. Oh, by the way, before we get there, someone is asking, do you think he has a personality personality disorder? What's your thought on that? I don't I don't think so. I think he's uh, I think he's a narcissist and and he just he just lives in a make believe world. Uh, he he wants he wants people to believe that he was something that he could never finish. And and that's just that's just where his mind is stuck. OK, thank you for sharing your thoughts on that. So you two were at a local bar together. Is that right? That's, that's the correct. story. Yep. Uh, will you tell that story? Uh, do you know which story I'm talking about? Yeah. So, yeah, it was uh, one. It was it was the last time I actually ever hung out with him. Uh, my wife, um, myself and uh, two other buddies. We went down to have, uh, it was, uh, veterans. Was it? Yeah. Veterans day. We went down for veterans day to have, have a couple of drinks at the local bar and we thought, Hey, let's get, let's get David down here and listen to some of his, uh, Marine Corps stories. So we invited him down. Uh, he, he asked if, uh, we would order his drink for him before he got there. And I said, I said, yeah, we'd do it. Uh, they ended up leaving, are we still good? <laughs> I don't know if you could hear. Okay. So we ended up uh, ordering his drink. They left it on the bar. He comes down, gets gets through his, uh, I want to say one, one thing, a crown, orders a Bud Light, takes a drink, and goes completely over backwards in his chair. Uh, he, is, he is completely wasted out of his mind. And, and this is off of, off of two drinks. And, and so my first buddy takes his loaded pistol off of him. David had a loaded gun on him in the bar, uh, goes to the bathroom, clears it out, make sure there's no more bullets in the chamber. Uh, we pick David up, get him outside. Uh, my buddy ends up handing me his pistol and we take, we take David and his truck back to his house. Uh, Becca is there. So I hand her the pistol. She sets it aside. We drop we dropped David off in his, in his recliner and we ended up. And by Becca, up. you mean Rebecca, Rebecca Barsati went by Becca. Is that correct. right? That's correct. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and so, uh, the next, the next morning he sends me a text message that says that he was in the ER all night. And, and I say, Hey, are you all right? And he goes, well, somebody roofied me. There was enough fentanyl in my body to kill three people. And, uh, and I was like, I was like, wow, that's, that's not good. And so right. 
so I'm thinking, I'm thinking, okay, well, if he's saying that he's being roofied at, a, at the bar, I'm going to tell, let the bar owner know that he's claiming that he's being drugged at the bar. And so she ends up, she ends up getting the cops involved uh, because it's her, it's her license on the line. Right. Cops, cops get involved. David's still texting me uh, saying that it was a poss- it was a possible hit. And he was wondering if it was the drink was meant for me and not him. Uh, and I was like, no, we're it, no, not even. And so the deputy end, ends up contacting me, gets the story from me. Uh, he goes, he goes to the hospital, finds out David never went to the emergency room at all. So he's just been feeding me another line. Um, so of course I called him out on it in the message and, and I can send you these messages too. They're, they're kind of funny because he goes in, he goes into how, the Marine Corps taught him to draw his own blood and test it, uh, pull hair and do samples on that. And so he did his own fentanyl test at home. And so he never, he's claiming after he said that he went to the ER, that he never went to the ER. He just did it all at home. Yet I did a screen capture of him saying that he was at the ER at all night. And then he, he uh, instantly replied back with, um, I've been advised not to speak about this. So he just, he just shuts down when you, when you call him out on his lies. He just shuts down. So he just, he shuts down. If you can talk anymore, if, if you can, if you can prove him wrong on anything, he'll either shut down or it's uh, top secret or uh, he can't, he's not authorized to talk about it. Fascinating. Fascinating. And so that was the last time you hung out. And and let me guess, was that by choice at that point? Or do you think he avoided you too, because he realized uh, maybe you knew too much? I think he, I think he avoided me more than I was avoiding him uh, because he did, uh, he did block me. Uh, and, and I did, I did reach out to him a couple of times uh, when I saw him living in the motel I reached out to see if he was doing okay. I just said, I said, Hey, I know we have our differences, anything I can do for you. Um, and then I reached out to him the day that we found out Rebecca was missing to see, you know, if they needed a search or if they needed help looking anywhere. And of course, no, no, uh, no response. And and that's about when I called and found out that, that he had me blocked. He has you blocked. Oh, he has me blocked. Yeah. Yeah. Fascinating. That that's interesting. I did not know that. Wow. Uh, he's not kidding around when he decides people are out of his life. I mean, oh he yeah, kind of yeah, knows I'm, something I'm, too. I'm sure. I'm sure he's. We got him on. We got a surveillance camera driving by our place at 20 miles an hour yesterday in a 45. So he's he's driving by. He's looking. He's just he's just not. Uh, he's just probably not doing it as much through phones and online stuff. Okay. So in other words, in other words, people are saying, by the way, that you've got some fans here in chat. I'll just say that. So, um, so thank you for being here. So you're, you're seeing surveillance of him driving by the house while your, your sign is out there. Is that your letterboard sign still there? I posted that by the way, on YouTube and Instagram and Facebook and all of our social media today. Uh, yeah. So, it's, oh, and Colette's asking you to post the footage. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's going to, yeah, I'll get that posted too. Um, but it'll, it'll definitely be there until I think of something, uh, something else to put up that's going to push his buttons even more. Um, you know, and, and, and I know, I know he did try to go in and get Merc three, uh, put on Rebecca's car because he has, he has possession of that now. And he was, he was denied that, uh, because he didn't have his VA, paperwork with him uh wow so so that was a good thing so i'm half i'm half tempted to just go spend the money and put merc three on my vehicle wow wow right (laughs) just just to troll them just go get merc three just to troll them please do that we will all support you and and applaud uh that effort um that would be the right reason to make sure that's your license plate um Speaking of surveillance camera, I haven't seen it, but, uh, you know, the sheriff's office is allegedly investigated and and they really just keep coming down to the same thing. They say they know a lot of things and uh, it's just clear that this was a river accident. 
But, uh, and, and they say he has an alias. That's important. They say that David has an alias that day that he was with Chris Kemp all day. Chris Kemp at that time was a jailer, uh, for mineral County. I learned today he's no longer employed or no longer a jailer, but, uh, that was his alias. As far as I know, is that what you're hearing too? Um, uh, correct me if uh, we have a different, it is. that's, yep. That's, that's who I heard it was as well. Um, and, and I, of course, uh friend re friend requested him on facebook and and either he instantly blocked me or he deleted his facebook because i can no longer find him so uh i'm sure they're still buddies yeah yeah um with that being said this alias comes into question on july 20th we're talking about july 20th 2021 the day that rebecca went missing because you say that a neighbor has surveillance of his car, one of his trucks leaving and then coming home several hours later. Is that accurate? Tell us a little bit about what you have seen in this surveillance video. I have not yet seen it. Yeah, the uh, the video that I've seen. So uh, I, I was actually approached about it um, and they have surveillance cameras. Uh, they have, um, uh, it's Merc two. It's his little black truck, uh, leaving July 20th at two, two Oh nine PM, uh, down his driveway. Now there's, it's really hard to see who's driving. Uh, but we do know it's his truck. We do know it's his license. Um, we just don't know who the driver is. Uh, I have, I have reached out to them again. Um, they did, they did originally make a copy. One was supposed to be for me. One was supposed to be for, um, uh, the family's private investigator. And then they were going to get one to, uh, the deputy, uh, I guess it'd be Sergeant Funkett. Now I know in, from text messages that day, uh, Sergeant Funk was over there viewing the video and he did get a copy of it. So I know Mineral County Sheriff's Department has that copy, um, I, I have seen the video. Uh, they have a backup of it on their, on their, um, cell phone. And so, uh, the individual is out of town right now. So as soon as they get back, I'm hoping to get you the copy. Okay. Thank you. So there is surveillance video that shows he was probably not home all day. Yeah. At least, at least his vehicle. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you to everyone who corrected me on alibi, not alias. I kept saying alias Jason Bourne would be the alias. Uh, the alibi would be what we were discussing. So sorry if that was confusing to you, Jason, too. I apologize. I, I got um, figured out. Yeah, you figured it out. So thank you to our chat for correcting and helping him understand what I was trying to say. This is why I love this community. Come on, Lauren, let's help you out. Um, with that being said, there's another investigation. Can I ask you about this? Another investigation? Oh, yeah. Into yeah, absolutely. David? Okay. Yep. Tell us about another investigation that's happening right now with David Barsotti. All right. So the, the day I ended up uh, leaving his court case uh, is when I called uh, to try to get his license place taken away. Uh, later that, later the March 25th, the DB case, you were, Correct. Okay, you were there. Okay. Yes. Uh, later, uh, later that week, I ended up calling uh, Veterans Affairs. They got me in contact with um, Veterans Affairs Division of a Division of Criminal Investigation. Uh, I ended up forwarding all the information that I had from the court case, it's DD two fourteen, to them. Uh, it took them a little bit of time, but three investigators called back. Um, they are investigating him. Uh, they are investigating his uh, VA home loan, his dis uh, DV plates. Uh, the money that he's been getting from the VA. Uh, I do know they, they have been out here doing surveillance um, and, and they have talked to several people uh, trying to confirm that uh, he can eat, he can drink, he can get dressed and he can drive without assistance because that's what, that's what a VA caregiver is for, is for individuals through the VA system that, that have difficulties eating by themselves, drinking by themselves. They can't drive. They can't, they can't get dressed without help. So that's, that's who he's stealing from right now. Wow. 
Right. He is still not, I mean, stolen valor. Literally, he is stealing. He's had round the clock caretakers um, because of his disability, uh, his shoulder in the military. And I, and I do believe that he did have surgery on his shoulder um, when he was, you know, from that weightlifting accident. Um, <laughs> but uh, right. According to the investigators that you've talked to in order for him to have these caretakers that he has, he's not supposed to be able to eat. He's not uh, himself. Like he's not supposed to be able to feed himself. He's not supposed to be able to drive and he's not supposed to be able to dress himself. That's correct. Um, yet we've seen videos of him training his dogs. We've seen videos of him driving. You, you, I, I noticed on a on a on a Mineral County Facebook group, you posted a picture of him parking one of his Merc One uh, trucks in a a handicap spot. So right. he's clearly driving to be able to park in those spots and. Uh, as far as you know, you've been to the bar with him. Could he feed himself? Could he? Oh, he, he feeds himself, drinks. Uh, he actually, uh, for a for a wedding that we had at our house, uh, he actually stayed up all night roasting an entire pig with uh, with Carlos. So, so yeah, I mean, he's he has no difficulties doing uh, life life projects. I have never seen him once need help with anything. Okay. Okay. Um, I asked you, Jason, to send me a contact, the contact info of one of the investigators working on the case. And just so everyone knows, before today's live, I tried to confirm that there was an ongoing investigation. I called, I got a voicemail, I left a message. That's how far I got. But I do want to say that on the voicemail, the man said that this is David with the veterans criminal investigations. So that was interesting to get that voicemail, not just investigations, but criminal investigations. So, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Michelle, for what you're saying here. Of course, I'm not mad about this. They used the VA for her father who had Alzheimer's and it was an honor to have the privilege of their help. That's, that's exactly what it should be used there. And there are many vets that struggle getting this help. My husband, John, is a psychologist and he worked for the VA and he helped those with uh, PTSD as well. So um, I know how important it is to have those services uh, and it's heartbreaking that people would take advantage of them and take that money from others. Um, what do you, thank you for sharing that. We'll be We'll be anxiously looking forward to what happens there. What you knew, Rebecca, um, what do you think happened? Can you share a theory with us? Yeah, I can. Uh, and, and of course, it's all speculation. Uh, unlike, unlike a lot of the stuff that I have, um, I can, I can back this up. This is just, this is just my thought. Um, we know ever since I I've met him, uh, He's from the first time he's come over, he's he said that Rebecca's wanted a divorce. Uh, the first couple times I've seen him, he's been crying over here, uh, drinks heavily. So I think I think she probably got to the point where she was ready to leave. Uh, she wanted she wanted half of everything, you know, half of what she was entitled to, which is including the house that her name's on. And he and he doesn't want to he didn't want to give that up. Uh, I think the reason she had his DD-214 in her possession is because that was the only thing that could technically bring him out, uh, bring him down. So she had that as a security blanket. Um, she probably went over that day, ends up, you know, they get into an argument. I could, I could probably picture David with his temper strangling her. Um, and, and the river, the whole river accident is just a decoy. You know, I think that um, with the with the dog being found that that soon um, in in the state that it was in, just right past the bridge, it makes me believe that that the dog was probably strangled and thrown off the bridge as well. And then and then, you know, I and I haven't seen pictures of uh, the state of Rebecca, but from what I understand, 
there wasn't, in my opinion, the decompensation uh, or the travel that or the damage that I think would tra happen in 26 miles and 10 and a half months in the river. And so I think that, you know, she she could have been in a freezer or somewhere cool. And once once that high water starts coming up in the in the spring, that that water is just it's fast. So now instead of being in Mineral County, they're going to be finding a body down in Flathead, and which is which is quite a ways here two two rivers over. Um, and and he was under the impression that, hey, if I if if I can uh, throw her over the bridge here nobody's going to find her until she ends up in flathead county well that that river dropped pretty suddenly because of the lack of the rain so that water level dropped they found they uh the fishermen ended up finding her in some bushes 300 yards down from a bridge and so i mean if that that could be a that could be a circumstance i don't know that's just that's just what i'm speculating and and i wouldn't be surprised if if it did come out that way. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing your thoughts to those again, that are just catching up on this case, because it is a, a fairly new case that hidden true crime has started covering. And we do want a lot of people to understand what's going on and to be caught up in this case. So we welcome newcomers to this case. Uh, Rebecca had left, had left after the D after the domestic violent assault uh, charges in March, 2021, Rebecca, and he was charged then with domestic violence and he spent a couple of nights in jail. Uh, David Barsati did. At that moment, Rebecca chose to leave and she filed a no contact order. And not only did she file the no, con or no contact order, I mean, she really meant this. She got her own place in Missoula, which is over an hour away. And her last trip to Superior was going to be allegedly to pick up the rest of her belongings for her new place to start fresh. And that is the day she went missing. That was all I needed to know, by the way, uh, when she was missing, I learned about this case and talked to her, her mother, Angela, while she was missing. And that was all I needed to know to be suspicious because as people have pointed out in the chat, uh, when a domestic violent survivor or victim leaves and files that no contact order, that is the most dangerous time for them. That alone is a threat, you know, to someone. So that's also telling, um, you know, Nathan, who's been on our show a couple of times also suspects that David placed Rebecca's body somewhere and kept it somewhere until he knew that the domestic violence, the, the, court case the hearing was over and that her parents were perhaps leaving town and that the other search there was an out-of-state search um, and rescue that came in to look and after that was all gone you know after everyone left that was when the body was found um, do you think that's you pointed out that you believe that where do you think he would have stored this body if that's the case it's uh, from from my understanding of the body, it, it would have had to have been somewhere cold, uh, somewhere in a somewhere in a freezer. Um, you know, if you if you bury her, uh, a lot of deep decomposition, decom dirt, everything's going to take place. So, you know, in I I would I would have to say it probably in the basement, uh, in a in a chest freezer. Um, there's, there's a lot of places that he probably could have gotten, gotten away with it. I do know, I, and I, I never did see the room finished. Uh, but when I first went over to his house, he gave me the tour of his place, uh, going downstairs and to the left, there are two, two doors. And, uh, one of them was going to be a secret room. Uh, he wanted to make it to where it looked like, uh, there wasn't even a door there. Uh, because he wanted to be able to hide his firearms and and whatever else in there. Um, after that, listening to some of uh, the other audio tapes, I know after Rebecca disappeared, uh, he had 
anger issues with anybody that ended up going downstairs, wouldn't let anybody downstairs, wouldn't let them clean. And so that just kind of, that just kind of ballooned my theory a little bit more, even though I've never seen the room or if he had finished it, uh, I just have to still speculate that it, it got done the way he said he wanted it done. Wow. You are the second person I've heard say that on our channel that he didn't want people in his basement. Um, and I know that somebody else has implied um, that there might be, you know, well, Colette Cox, uh, you shared some things with me. I don't know if I'm allowed to share what you've shared with me or not. So maybe send me a text um, and let me know if I can share some things that you've shared with me about people not being able to go to the basement and other things he had there. Thank you. And then I also want to point out somebody else that we have in chat. Uh, Shane Bishop is here tonight asking some questions, some important questions. Uh, have you talked to Shane? Have you talked to Shane, Jason? I have. I have talked to Shane today. Yes. You have talked to Shane. Shane Bishop is a producer with Dateline. So we are very grateful to have him here and interested in the details that he is asking. So thanks for being here, Shane. And I hope I didn't blow your cover. But when you're going to be on YouTube asking questions with your full name, I'm going to say who you are. <laughs> so um, Shane is good people. So thank you for being here. Uh, we hope, we hope, our fingers are crossed, that Dateline might possibly cover Rebecca's case. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Uh, so thank you for being here and learning more tonight. Yeah. Um, tell us a little bit about the river. You know, we're unfamiliar with the area. Uh, I've seen a picture. It's like a beach where they suspect that Rebecca played with her dog Cerberus or where the sheriff's department suggests that happened. Um, and it was July. Is this a very dangerous area? Is this, would it make sense to sort of set the stage here or if this really happened that it could happen? So in July, the river is extremely low, uh, especially on, on the 20th of July. Uh, we start getting some really hot uh, uh, weather. The, the river drops um, and, it, and it starts getting into that point where the, the water is so low and it's running so slow that we get fishing restrictions. It gets too warm for the fish. So they, they pull the fishermen back, let the water cool down at night. Um, and so the, the area that she went missing in is, is a really well-known fishing, uh, swimming area. Uh, at any given time, I pass that place, uh, two times a day. I work in Missoula. And so Monday through Friday, I'm driving through and you can look over and, and in July, that entire parking lot is full of people. Uh, she, and of course she was swimming. It's a big giant pool. Uh, she was swimming and playing with her dog on, uh, the opposite side of this big rock. And so, uh, from the beach, you can't, you wouldn't have been able to see her, but if you jumped in the water, you can see everybody that's in the water. You can see, hmm. you can see past the rock. And, and so if, it's it's extremely hard for me to believe that a dog and a female can float through all those people and struggle and and not be caught, not be caught by somebody. Um, I would I would be it'd be easy to say there's 40, 40 people there uh, at any given time during the summer months through July, uh, right past that pool it starts shallowing out really well. So you could, you could almost walk across that water, um, driving through there right after this happened and they were given the location. Uh, the, the water was extremely shallow right past there. Um, I would, I would think most people, you know, current aside, you probably could have walked through the next hundred yards or the next hundred, 200 yards of stretch of river. Um, and then, and then as the narrow, as the, the Canyon narrows, the water's going to get deeper, of course. And then it eventually goes through the, the gorge, which is a bunch of white water. Uh, but once you get into that area, you're looking at the, the, uh, commercial rafters that are taking, uh, day trips out there. Um, so it's, it's constantly flooded with fishermen, rafters, uh, people on inner tubes and, 
I just, I, I still, I don't buy it. I just don't buy the whole, the whole drowning. Yeah, right. It just doesn't make sense. And other people are confirming what you say that it just doesn't make sense. Um, yeah, I agree with that. Shane uh, Bishop, by the way, he says, thanks everyone for the welcome. I'm from Montana. And so I take everything that happens here personally. He is, he is a Montana boy, just like, just like you, Jason. So thank you, Shane. And, and he, he, he shared above, I don't know if everyone saw it, but he said Dateline is working on this case. So let's help Dateline out everyone. Uh, thank you for everyone that's being here and for the information you've gathered for Dateline and for Shane so far. Um, justice for Rebecca. I, I'll share my speculation um, a bit too. Speculation here. I'm taking off my journalist hat, which which I do a lot on our lives, but uh, sharing my opinion pieces. But but I agree. I just don't think she drowned, and I am disappointed to say the least with the Mineral County Sheriff's Office, who has still, to this day, almost a year later, not opened up a criminal investigation or even investigated not just the disappearance and death of Rebecca, but the death threats against her parents that we have posted on our hidden true crime channel, as well as true crime underground. They have also posted some different ones and there are more coming from different people. Um, that alone is its own investigation and own crime. So I hope that the mineral County Sheriff's office does indeed start taking this case seriously. And I, and I would like to ask you, Jason, um, do you agree that there seems to be inaction with law enforcement after, after, after sharing my strong opinion, now I'll ask you. So do you, do you see some inaction? It might not be as strong of an opinion as, as me, but what, what are you seeing? I, I see inaction just not with the sheriff's department, but I see it with the commissioners. Uh, I see it with the um, county attorney's office. And, and this is this is something that's been ongoing ever since it, ever since we've moved here. Uh, if you hold if you hold a public figure or your friends of the people that are in that are public figures, you get protected. Uh, there's no there's no repercussions for anything that you do. It's a, it's a slap on the wrist, a talking to, um, and they, they need to be treated just like everybody else, but they're not, they get away with, they get away with things they shouldn't be able to get away with, but nobody's holding them, holding them accountable. Hmm. Okay. Um, yeah. And so you think. I mean, what do you think the motive is for the lack of the lack of action and what you see that no, nobody's holding them accountable, but, but you know, why, you know, why are they holding themselves accountable to what, what do you think it is? I think, I think they're trying to protect themselves. I think, I think at some point something was botched and they know it and it's, and it's easier to uh, write it off as a missing person or a drowning. Well, it's a, uh, it was a missing person. Um, but write it off as a drowning, then admit that they were wrong. And, and okay. I think, and I think that's kind of the direction unless, unless the autopsy can prove something differently. Okay. I'm going to rephrase what you said in, in my words and how I internalize it. They care, they care more about not being wrong then they care about Rebecca Barsotti. Correct. And a, and, a, and a likely possibly murdered woman and a murderer who is possibly in their town. That's, that's how I internalize it. Mm -hmm. So, um, Tara Wells earlier, I wrote down the question. She said, I, I'm catching up on the case. Has another autopsy been done? I am in touch with Angela. Angela is Rebecca's mother. And they have not been able to get her, their second autopsy that they requested with a professional. But with that being said, I do know that her remains are still at the Montana crime lab. And to me, that seems suspicious that they're holding her. Usually they, if someone 
if they had someone drowned ex accidentally or, you know, it was, I think there would be a little bit more happening. So I am curious about why uh, Montana's um, state crime lab still has her remains as far as I know. That's, that's what I know. I don't know if you know anything else, um, Jason, about that. No, I don't. I just, I know that uh, there have uh, been other drowning victims uh, here in the state recently and, and their autopsies are already done. Their, the funerals are already being planned. And so something's holding this up on the backside. Um, but you know, of course, we're not privy to that information, of course. So. Right. Right. That's where we have to lean on Shane Bishop. You still hear right. Shane? <laughs> uh, hopefully he'll be able to solve those things for us. And, and again, we're so grateful to have uh, Dateline here tonight and Dateline interested and in, in on top of Rebecca's case. Um, the dogs. There are a lot of questions about the dogs that David trained. He has a TikTok account that if anyone has that address, since I'm bringing it up, uh, why don't you share the address? I've never really shared it publicly before because I thought, oh gosh, someone's going to take down their TikTok account when we, we mention it, but I just mentioned it. So whoever has a, a, you know, the account or the link to David's TikTok, uh, feel free to share it. I think most people have already screen recorded all of his videos, but on there, it's, it's, I would call it a little concerning seeing these dogs he's training. It's almost as if they're training them to be attack dogs. Um, do you know anything about these dogs being trained on your street or in this neighborhood? These yeah. Dogs? Uh, we've had, we've had some experience. Uh, he's, he's brought, he's brought one of his dogs over here before, uh, when, uh, Rebecca got hers, we were over, uh, that day we saw her puppy and then the dog that he usually goes around with, uh, which I don't really re recall what the name of the dog was, but we were all sitting out back on the porch having a few drinks and, and, uh, uh, his dog, who's this fierce mean attack dog, uh, when we first got there, came out, greeted us at the, at the car, petted him. We, we walked inside and he goes, he said, oh, you can't touch that dog. He's a vicious, you know, he's a trained attack dog. And, and I was like, okay, whatever. So we ended up, we ended up sitting on the back porch, having a few drinks and the dog brings me a Frisbee, puts the Frisbee in my lap. I start throwing him a Frisbee and it took about five, 10 minutes, maybe for David to even catch on that. I was playing Frisbee with his dog and he completely lost it. He goes, oh, you can't, you can't play Frisbee with attack dogs and, and I was like, okay, this is just a, this is a, just a regular dog that you are training to be something that it's not kind of, kind of similar to your own persona. And so, uh, we ended up, we were at his other neighbor's house fixing a water line and a Belgian Malawa came running over to us, uh, did not want to go back to the house. Uh, I walked over, ended up getting David, told him his dog was over there. So as he was walking out, he was electrocuting this dog with a shot collar the entire time. And we're a couple hundred yards away from it. And all I hear is this dog just yelping and, and uh, whimpering. And, and I'm like, dude, just stop. And he goes, nope, this is, this is how he's going to learn. You got you to gotta shock him. And just electrocuted this dog the entire way. So when we ended up getting to where we could see him, the dog was cowered down in some bushes didn't want to come out. Uh, and he, he finally goes over, grabs the dog by the collar, drags it out of the, out of the brush. And I was like, I was like, dude, just stop. You got him now. And, uh, uh, he sat there and talked to me for a second, petted the dog. And he was telling me that, uh, the dog was a new rescue from, uh, a hurricane, um, somewhere. I don't remember exactly where he said he went and just picked the dog up. And uh, the dog just didn't know how to listen to him yet. So uh, probably in a lot of things, he 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 trains with abuse, you know, and, and that's that's even shown in the way he, he treats his animals. Wow. Right. So he doesn't treat his his animals any better than he treated his wife, allegedly. Correct. Yeah. That's that's a terrible story. As Julie says, that's that's sickening. Um, yeah. 
Stephanie, I, I agree. Someone needs to call the Humane Society and report him. By the way, for those watching right now, we have 400 people watching. Could you please give this video a like and please subscribe to Hidden True Crime, our YouTube channel. It is so appreciated and it helps our video to get out to more people. When our videos get out to more people, we're the only YouTube channel right now covering Rebecca Barsetti. More people learn about Rebecca. So for Hidden True Crime, but also for Rebecca and her case, uh, please share this video, like this video, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Is there a secret room in David's basement that you know about? There, uh, I'm hearing rumors. There, there was, there was definitely going to be. Uh, I never, I never got to see it finished. Um, he told me where it was going to be. He showed me where it was going to be. I was in the room prior to him working on it. Um, watched him pack material in, uh, just driving by uh, his house to our place. However, if he ever got the secret room done, I don't know. Uh, I just, I never saw the finished state. Um, but that was, that was his end goal. His end goal was a secret room. His end goal was a secret room in the basement uh, where he was going to, where he was going to store his uh, firearms, ammunition, um, whatever else, secret service stuff he has. Right. Whatever else. Yeah whatever else, whatever else. Jeez. Um, he was a hunter. Uh, you know, I'm not a hunter, so I don't understand the culture as much. I know it's big there in Montana. Um, when people hunt, do they have extra freezers? Also, this is just a question I have, and this is where my brain is going. I, I wonder why, but do they have extra freezers to store game or, or, or meat that they've of animals that they've shot. I'm just trying to understand if it really could possibly have an extra freezer and no one thought anything of it. That's exactly yeah, it's, if you want to know what I'm really thinking. Yeah, he, he did. Uh, he did ask me for a place to go hunt. So I drew him a map. And so, of course, when Rebecca went missing, I thought, well, OK, maybe that's where he went with her. Um, but it is it is not uncommon for us hunters to have uh, one to two chest freezers. Um, you know, the, uh, if you get a, if you get a bull elk, it's going to take, it's going to take one of the large chest freezers to, to hold that animal. Um, if you get, uh, a deer with it, you're going to need another chest freezer. Uh, my wife and I both hunt. And so technically, you know, you get two, two, 800 pound elk, two couple hundred pound deer. It's, it's a lot of cheese, uh, chest freezer space that you need. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. In, in other words, it would not be uncommon. Yeah. For him to have had that extra freezer space. If you know where I'm going. Um, I don't know if you can answer this or if you have anything to say, but I'm very curious to know more about Carlos and you mentioned Carlos. So I don't know if he's a friend of yours. And so again, you can say you don't know much, but Carlos comes up a lot. If I'm going to be really, yeah, I'll be really honest. I've been, I've been, I have been privy to some of the texts on Rebecca's phone and Carlos was texting her. And then in the pictures you have exchanged with um, true crime underground and others, there seems to be some things in the background uh, where Carlos's name is mentioned. I won't say anything else about that, but um, do you know who Carlos was and how close they were to the Barsati? He was to the Barsati's or who he was. And if I it's a friend of yours, we'll move on. But no, no, I, I, I met him one time. Uh, that was when they were doing the pig roast over at our place for the wedding. Um, Carlos was, uh, and I, I couldn't tell you whose friend he was, whether he was Rebecca's or David's. Um, but he was the one that was helping that night with the, with the roast. Um, I don't know if, David was really fond of him or if he, if it was a joke, uh, but he refers to him as the slant eyed Mexican. And so, you know, he's got his derogatory name for Carlos. And so I don't know. Oh, wow. I don't know if he's Rebecca's friend. I don't know if he's David's friend. Right. When I, when I talked to him, uh, it was, it was just throughout the night. Uh, they were up, they were up all night. And when, 
David would leave. I'd go out and hang out with Carlos, sit with him, drink a beer. We'd sit there and spin the pig. Um, but that was, that was my interaction with him. Okay. Thank you. We're, we're uh, a lot of, uh, internet sleuths are trying to figure that bit out. So thank you. Yep. Thank you. Is we, uh, one last question. We we've talked about it already a bit, but I, I just want to go a little bit further with it. You, you don't believe that Rebecca's body, um, could have been placed, had been spent 10 months in the river. Do you know anything about that? I don't know. Um, like the dog's body was found just terrible in terrible shape. Just, and I don't know, just a couple of weeks later, if someone was in the river that long, do you know what it would be like? I know you're not a forensic scientist, but you are, you know, you've had time in the military. Um, do you know anything about that? You're a hunter about, um, if, if she had been in that river for a long time, for as long as, you know, 11 months, 10 months, what would she even be recognizable? I mean, what, what would you suspect? No. And, and, uh, as, uh, I was born and raised on a ranch down in Darby and, and we deal with a lot of, um, predator, uh, nuisance animals, uh, muskrats, for example. Um, there's just a giant rat that, that dig, dig into your ditch banks and create erosion and, and problems for your irrigation. And so I've seen, I've seen, you know, even a muskrat that's been in the water for a uh, couple months, uh, the, the hair is falling off. If you go to take them out with a shovel, uh, the, the skin and everything slough off, they start decomposing. Mm -hmm. And, and that's just after a few months. And so for her to be in the state that I believe they say she's in, uh, it was going to have to be nearly freezing water uh, the entire time. So you look at, um, uh, let's say July, August, September, it really doesn't start cooling off, getting really cold until October and into November into those freezing temperatures. So, so we're well above freezing, even, even in some of those deeper pools, uh, you're not going to be at that, at that temperature where it's going to preserve a body. Thank you. What was the moment when she went missing? Did you suspect him right away or, or did you believe it was an accidental drowning at first? What was the moment you thought, Hmm, something's not right. I think, I think we have, and I, and I'd have to, I'd have to look at my text messages, but it was either, either that night or early the next morning on my way into work, I texted uh, my wife and, and a buddy both at the same time. And I said, David killed her, didn't he? And, and they both agreed. And so it was within a few hours to 12 hours, maybe the next morning before we, we started believing that that's happened. And that's just from the way we've seen him in the, in the past with her, uh, he, he has basically emotionally separated from himself from her. Uh, as far as we knew for the, for almost for the longest while, we didn't even know they were married. He only referred to her as his caregiver. He never said, this Whoa. is my wife. He never introduced her as his wife. It was always, this is my caregiver or, uh, I can have my caregiver come pick this up or my caregiver is going to make dinner tonight. You want to come over? It was never my wife. So, so right there, that just tells me he's, he wants to take that, uh, emotional piece and separate himself away from it. I agree. I agree. Wow. So you didn't even know they were married for a bit. Right. Did he talk about divorce or anything with you? Uh, just, just the one time when he was, he ended up coming over, uh, uh, he was sitting on my Harley crying and I asked him what was wrong. Uh, and he said that, that Rebecca was leaving him. She wanted, he, she wanted a divorce. And, and this was, this was a full year prior to any of this happening. And so, so I know, I know there's been things going on for, for at least a year, uh, prior to that. Um, but other than that, 
uh, he would just kind of mention it, you know, she still wants a divorce, but we would never get into why she wanted a divorce or if they were doing the papers or, or anything. Okay. Lindsay Lou asks, yeah, thank you. Lindsay Lou asks if he ever, uh, lied about his age to you essentially like he did with Nathan. Not, not that I recall. And I think, um, I'm trying to, ex I'm trying to remember. Yeah, no, he never, he never lied about our, his age to us. Uh, he was, he was pretty upfront. And I think it was because, uh, we, we are really similar in age. And so, uh, that was, a that was probably about the only thing he had in common with me. Okay. Right. Someone said, wait, he was sitting on your Harley crying. Who sits on somebody else's Harley and cry? <laughs> Julie Holden says, I'm clearly David Barsavi. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anything else that you want to share tonight? Uh, you, you know, not, not that I can think of right offhand. Um, but if uh, something else pops up or uh, I'm going through some old text messages or uh, phone calls and I wish I, if, I knew how everything was going to turn out. I probably would have kept some of those old uh, phone calls and voicemails, sure. um, especially the ones where uh, we like, we like lighting off fireworks and we do it, we do it year round uh, at times. And, and he would, he would call me belligerent saying that my fireworks were setting off his PTSD from the war. And, and, uh, and they were just so annoying mm -hmm. that I deleted them, but yeah, um, but yeah, I'll definitely, I'll definitely keep trying to dig up uh, some stuff through the old archives. Thank you. And that surveillance, you know, camera from your neighbor was sent to the sheriff's office. A lot of people have called the sheriff's office. They've told me and they've never received callbacks. Uh, and that, that surveillance footage you had was also sent, correct? Yes. Yep. And so what I'll do is uh, I even have uh, uh text messages from the sheriff's department while they were over at the house watching the, the video and getting a copy of of that so i know they have that surveillance camera footage so okay thank you um there was one thing i want last oh uh what's next for you and for this story as in you have been an ally for many even those i think you don't know uh, people have been grateful that you've come forward and been brave enough to do that. Again, some people have told me that uh, they're looking for more allies. Well, well, I think I can say this. I think I can say this. Nathan, Nathan has said that uh, he said on our lives that he's scared. And when he knew you were coming forward and he saw your sign, he said, this is what I'm waiting for. I'm just waiting for more people to be brave enough to come forward because he's scared. So I want you to know that what you're doing is making a big difference. Uh, with that being said, back to the question I asked, uh, what's next when it comes to this case and your sign and speaking uh, out? I'm going to just, I'm going to just keep pushing forward. Um, the only thing, the only thing that David has for himself right now or has in his life is his stories. And so as long as we can keep, as long as we can keep, proven that he's a liar he doesn't have the he doesn't have anything anymore uh he's he's gonna break it sometime he's he's gonna have to give up uh or move you know you can't you can't sit there and expect and we have a frozen you're frozen jason i loved what he was saying in other words, all, oh, and there you are, there you are, you froze for a bit, yep. but I, I loved what you were saying. In other words, all he has are his stories. So if we yep. keep on this and keep digging and keep investigating, um, and I, and I don't want to feel, say what you're going to finish with there, but what, what do you think if, if we keep exposing his stories, um, he'll, he'll crack or yeah i mean he's he's got he's got nothing else that's that's all he has in his life right is his story so uh you know he's he's probably never gonna crack he's a narcissist he believes he believes what he says 
And so, so he's going to just go somewhere else. And so that's what we need to do. He doesn't want his name. He doesn't want his name on the internet. He doesn't want his picture on the internet. He doesn't want his stories uh, uh, being debunked out on the internet. And so, so we need to make everything we can about him public. So no matter where he goes, people know who they know who he is. He can't, he's not going to do this in the next town that he goes to. Yeah. Right. Uh, agree. Ozzy Tad agree. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jason, for joining us. Tell your family. Thank you as well. I know it took a, a time away from family time and it just, it means a lot. Thank you for doing the right thing. Thank you again for your service and we'll be in touch and right. uh, hope to have you back one day. Thank you so much. We'll see ya. All right. Thank you.